Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining the panel on the value of SSI to organizations and citizens in South Africa. Uh, my name is Luan Spies. I'll be the moderator for the panel today. And I would like to give a brief moment to all the panelists to introduce themselves. Um, Terry Kelly, he's the founder and director of the Digital Data Bank. Um, Terry, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes. Um, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the session. Um, my background has predominantly been in um, cybersecurity and privacy, and uh, I've recently moved into into a um, development role with the Digital Data Bank in developing a consent-driven um, personal data exchange. Great, thank you, Dale. Um, Dalian Dale, she's the executive head of Secure Citizen. If you can introduce yourself as well. Hi everybody, I'm Delene Deal. I'm the Executive Head of Secure Citizen. I have a background in financial services, working in a bank as well as a bureau, and now head up a digital identity uh, company in, in South Africa in partnership with Southern African Fraud Prevention Services. Great. And then we have Mark Brits, Senior General Manager at the Banking Association of South Africa. Mark Thanks, Ron. And, uh... Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Brits, and um, I do a lot of banking, as you can imagine. And uh, my big excitement around digital identity is the first real innovation that's going to change uh, the financial sector. So I'm very excited about being here. Thank you. And then we have Sean Mouton, Chief Technology Manager um, and Head of R&D at EPSA Bank. Sean, if you can introduce yourself, please. Hi, uh, Sean Mouton. Uh, as Lawan said, Head of R&D at APSA. Uh, our current focus is, um, let's call it SSI, digital identity. It goes by different names. Um, and then, of course, uh, mainly looking at, uh, let's call it blockchain DLT solutions within this ecosystem. Good. Thank you, Sean. And then we have Anushka Soma Patel, uh, last panelist. She's the product manager for Atala Prism Ecosystem at Info Hong Kong. Anushka, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Anushka Soma Patel. So, my um, love for SSI actually started off in about 2018. Um, I am also the current co chair of the South African Financial Blockchain Consortium Identity uh, Working Group. And, you know, with the initiatives we started there in 2019 and where we are today, you know, participating in the Banks of Africa initiative, I think we're definitely taking steps in the right direction towards getting SSI to be more mainstream. Uh, so I really look forward to this discussion today because I believe that a brighter future awaits us all. Thanks, Rohan. Thank you very much, Anushka. Um, so... As you can see, we have a, a very exciting team of panelists here on the, on the call today. And I just want to kind of do a bit of housekeeping. First of all, for the, for the audience, if you want to ask questions, can you please post them in the Q&A channel instead of the discuss channel um, on the call? Because I'll be monitor, monitoring the Q&A specifically. And then I, just, I would just like to kind of give you a bit of a background um, and provide you some details around the terminology that we will be throwing around here. So the first one would be SSI. You will see in the title of the panel, we talk about this concept called SSI. What is SSI? So SSI is a self-sovereign identity, and the panelists will give you much more detail around what exactly it is, where it comes from, and how, how it relates to digital identity itself. Um, but the problem that we are facing today is really around, uh, we don't really have a very efficient mechanism to do digital identity related interactions. Um, for the most part, our identity is fractured and fragmented across multiple organizations. Um, we don't have control over that identity. Uh, our current paper-based credentials like an ID document, a driver's license, a passport is not made to natively work on the internet in a digital interaction. And what we are trying to solve here and what this concept of digital entity is all about is how do we go from these paper-based credentials into a world where we have credentials that are effectively 
natively digitally, digitally enabled. <clears throat> and where these credentials are uh, very easy to verify, so the cost of verification comes down significantly, and the ability for you to interact with transactions and get access to services are reduced from a timing perspective significantly um, by utilizing technologies such as digital identity. And my first question would go to, to Terry. Um, Terry, as the um, CEO and founder of the Digital Data Bank, we are talking about this concept of digital identity. Um, how is your solution making it easier for people to interact online, to share their information in a digital way? And then secondly, how do you see your system um, interacting with this digital identity, self zone identity community going forward? Yeah, thanks, Lohan. Um, the, to answer the first question, the, the digital data bank um, the concept that we're using in the digital data bank is, is that it's based on the fact that in South Africa, there is only one source currently of digital, of identity, and that's with home affairs, but it has no form of digital identity. So that it's all, as you say, paper-based. And when you're born, you get given a death certificate, some information gets registered around you. Um, and it's not until you get an ID book that you actually got any form of, of actual identity. And once you've got that, you then have to use that document, that manual document or that physical document to prove your identity. What we've done at the Digital Data Bank is that we've taken our, our platform and we've integrated it into or with an API into Home Affairs where we can, first of all, match the name, surname, and ID number, and obviously your gender and uh, date of birth um, with Home Affairs. And then once we've done that, we then do an authentication, a biometric authentication, and that either be via fingerprint or it can be via facial recognition. And once we've created that, we create uh, um, a, um, a digital identity for the individual. And that enables the individual from that point onwards to always be able to work from within their platform or their ecosystem um, or the exchange as we call it, they're able to interact with anybody over the internet and the person they're interacting with or transacting with knows that that person has been verified and, and authenticated. So what we've done is we've put, we've put the authentication back in the hands of the individual rather than <clears throat> excuse me rather than the bank or the insurance company or whoever whoever else they might be interacting with rather than them having to authenticate that person every time so it was it's, it's a very simple solution to a very complex problem um, and as was being discussed um, before we came on on online was you know when do you need to have full identity and when don't you and there's different levels um, and Deline was saying that you know, when you go into a bar or a, or a nightclub or anything, they only have to know whether you're over 18. They don't need to know any of, any of your other details. Um, and with the digital data bank platform, we're able to do that. And the only reason that we went down that road was simply because we felt that people had to take control of their own information. They had to be able to disseminate that information and track who they've shared that information with but the person receiving it needed to know that, that the, it came from the, the person they think it came from. And fundamentally, that's how we've solved the problem for a number of institutions, not banks, but a number of other institutions. And, you know, it goes for schools, universities, doctors, hospitals, um, medical aid, employers, all those kind of uh, areas of, of identi where identification is required. Great. So... Um, it's very interesting because you mentioned a few things um, that resonates quite well with me, like being able to give the user back control and how they control their data, when they consent for this data to be authorized and how they can share information in, a, in an online world. Um, and that is very aligned with the concept of digital or more specifically in my world, self-sovereign identity. So how do you... How do you foresee your system in the future um, kind of 
integrating with this whole new paradigm of identity called self-sovereign um, self identity? Lohan, we, we, we don't really um, look at, um, at, at our function as, as, as a company to, to deliver identity. We're doing it simply because there is no other mechanism to, for it to be done at the moment. But what we have done um, is that we've built a, um, an audit trail, a ledger, uh, an event manager, whatever you want to call it, into a person's vault. So when you open up a vault, um, every transaction, every event, every log that you take is, is, is entered into your ledger. And at any time in the future, you can take your capsule of data and you could nest it onto a blockchain with that ledger and have the history behind it. Because it is going to get to the point where, where SSI will be a far better mechanism for identification. And the reason I say that is that, you know, there are, there are a billion people in the world, which is 15% of the population, who have no form of identity at all. And there's 2 billion more who have an identity but can't use it because they have no mechanism to use it. So they don't have an ID book or a, any kind of document. They just know that they've been registered at birth. So self-sovereign identity, I think, is going to help in that area immensely. Um, and what we will do is we will then use that as our mechanism for identification in the future. But I don't think we're there yet, and I think we've still got a way to go before we get there. And our solution is, you can call it an intermediary solution, but it is something that is available now. Great, thank you very much. So we've heard about like what uh, Terry mentioned and um, termed like intermediary solutions. And I would like to move over into more of the, how can I say, um, moving towards this concept of self and identity um, by the panelists. And Alian, you have been uh, pivotal in building a platform called Secure Citizen. Mm -hmm. And Secure Citizen is a, a digitally enabled um, onboarding and verification platform. Um, can you, first of all, just take us and provide the audience with a view of what is this thing called digital identity or self sovereign identity? Because I think a lot of the audience might understand the concept, but can you give us a bit more detail of what are we really referring to here? So I, I think the easiest way, and we've, we've, we've presented digital identity. Believe you, to, not you muted. Really? No, you myself. Can, can you hear me now? I can no. hear you. Okay, so we've, we've presented um, the Secure Citizen um, solution to quite a number of companies. And as, as um, a, a, an, a company that is part owned by Southern African Fraud Prevention Services, our aim is very similar to the Digital Data Bank, where we want to create the capability for people to own their identity. And the easiest way to explain this is if you think about how people have historically verified their identity, the, the traditional methods are fundamentally flawed. If you think about when you need to open a bank account or you need to prove who you are, you take a copy of your, your ID document that was given to you um, by the Department of Home Affairs, and you go to a commissioner of oaths like a policeman or, or, or another commissioner of oaths in a bank, and they'll look at you and they'll look at the ID document and then they'll stamp the physical piece of paper and say, cool, you are who you claim to be. But at no point did they link to the Department of Home Affairs to verify that. So we, we are actually introducing risk in that element. Similarly, if you look at the number of data breaches that have happened globally, when you need to verify the identity of an indi individual remotely, we used to ask these random questions called knowledge-based authentication. But if you think about the number of data breaches that have happened, that solution has also lost its efficacy. And there is ultimately a breakdown in trust. So similarly, we've, we've created this capability where we are able to either via a corporate or directly enroll an individual into a digital identity ecosystem where the individual then has the capability of being verified and everybody in that ecosystem can then trust 
based on the, the biometric verification that the individual is who they claim to, to be and it's and it's verified against a golden source, not, namely the Department of Home Affairs. We additionally add a voice capability because we, we believe that it's important to create digital inclusivity. So if I have a feature phone, it doesn't mean that I'm any less of a possible victim. We just do what we call ground truthing, where we capture you and we verify you and then we add a voice to it. Future, if you think about when you engage with uh, a lot of the companies that say my voice is my password, that is biometric verification of a digital identity. What is important to distinguish though is a digital onboarding company takes an individual like Lohan and, and onboards them into a company's system or database for a specific purpose, creating an account or, or creating a membership or getting a service like a cell phone contract. However, what we've done is we, a digital identity creates a one-to-many where you have verifiers in the digital ecosystem that can validate that once I've come into this ecosystem, then I'm able to transact across a multitude of companies while remaining in control of my data and also making the companies Papia and, and anti-money laundering compliant and creating that uh, element of reducing risk for them but the consumer also feels more secure when they're engaging with a company because now if I phone you, you don't have to ask me questions anymore. I, you can send me a link and I'll, do, I'll take a selfie and I'll verify. You can verify through that biometric verification that you are who you claim to be. And then we can just conclude the business that we're, that we're why I called you. And the companies can focus on what it is that they want to deliver from a service perspective while a digital identity company acts as the, the custodian of preventing fraud for them. This is very inspiring and, and clearly um, already a step in the right direction when we talk about the concept of digital identity. But a question I would like to ask you is, um, what does a consumer need to understand when they kind of go into this world of digital identity? Because I, th I think that everybody is very well versed and used to the concept of I take out my digital identity card or my passport and I show it to access some services. Mm -hmm. But suddenly we are we are referring to a complete new paradigm here. You're not going to take out a card or a document. You need to click a button. And what do consumers really really need to understand? And how would that change their behavior utilizing these uh, digital identity technologies? Well, I think one of the things that is most important for a consumer to know is that just because you're not digitally active doesn't mean that you're any less of a potential victim. The fraudster really doesn't care whether you're older, whether whether you're digitally active or not. If you're older than 18, you are a potential victim. Similarly, I mean, the Department of Home Affairs is, is currently working on a, a, a national identity system, the NIS, and they're modernizing the way that we use identity. But that is because fraudsters use innovation and technology and, and they're relentless. They run a business much like we do, right? They have strategies, they have technology, they, they have, they have a, a, a target market, except they don't make customers, they make victims. But it's really important for, for consumers to know that what we're doing is we're leaning into technology rather than shying away from it. We are actually using innovation to combat fraud and to, and although it's not a silver bullet, what we are doing is we are increasing the risk mitigation when it comes to engaging, whether remotely or in a live environment. Just because I'm standing in front of you and I'm showing an identity document doesn't mean that I really am who I claim to be. What we're doing is creating the digital highway that allows the ability to validate that the person standing in front of you has the right to use that identity. I noticed that one of the questions that came up in the in the Q&A was about that discussion that we were having prior to this uh, us going live about you know why how would a company use my information like a bar or a club or or even if you're signing a contract the company needs to make sure that you are over 18 and have the right to sign an agreement quite simply we are creating the capability for people to be able to select what is it that is important for me to conclude this transaction and how do I display that with you without 
creating risk for myself. So you don't need to know what my age is. You don't need to know where I live, but you do need to know what my name and surname is, that I'm potentially vaccinated if I'm going to enter your property, or that I am of age where I'm allowed to enter your property. Those are the kind of things that we can use this for. We've even gone live in companies where we do contactless deliveries because you don't want to touch people's paper uh, clipboards anymore. But if I'm delivering Schedule 6 drugs to you, you need to make sure that you're giving it to the right recipient. If I'm delivering a phone, an expensive phone, you don't want to give it to the wrong person. So we've gone live with a company like Skynet where they do contactless delivery and it's verified against the Department of Home Affairs. We are able to pay with face. Pin, pin codes can be stolen. So if you take out a contract with, with JD Group and, you, and you've got revolving credit, you don't have to enter your PIN anymore. You take a selfie and that concludes the payment. The, the use cases have gone from account creation to consent management to, to compliance and regulation. It, the, the use cases are limitless, really. Great. And the people love what you are saying, which is uh, very inspiring um, once again. Uh, and I, I want to move over to, to Mark Brits and... As Talian mentioned, the use cases for digital identity, a lot of the times we think about it and it's like, you know what, we need this old, <laughs> I hate the word, but anyway, we need this, this idea of know your customer to be able to access a service. Um, but that is a very short-sighted use case of, of identity. Identity is so much more diverse than having a, K, a KYC credential or a KYC capability to open a bank account. Identity is actually something that we use daily in multiple interactions. In fact, we are now using our identity on this call. I'm presenting myself, I'm Luan, and I'm here as a moderator, and, and so are the panelists. So, Mark, um, why? I, I'm going to ask you two questions back to back. Um, so, first of all, why are the banks becoming involved in this concept of identity? And then secondly, where are we in South Africa in terms of the digital identity journey? So thanks, Lauren. I mean, uh, around the world, uh, banks can fulfill a number of roles uh, from what is called a, a relying party, which is a passive activity. And if you looked at a country like Estonia, uh, the, the customers are being on onboarded by a government ID, uh, which provides the bank with the benefit of cost saving. There's another role that a bank can play in terms of a, an attribute service provider. And in Canada, um, a product called Verify Me uh, allows third parties to get in touch with the bank and confirm the data that is held by the bank. So, for example, if you wanted to rent an apartment or something like that. Uh, and they could even go as far as becoming a system operator, uh, where in, I think, Norway, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a potential to generate revenues around the actual product of digital identity. So there's a variety of roles that the banks can play. But the banking industry, despite all the popular narratives that you read about, have a high trust factor. All your financial information is held by the banks and the banks don't sell their data and they're highly regulated, which is allowing us to have that high degree of trust with the consumer. And then the second element for banks to consider is friction cost, because the onboarding and KYC uh, is, is a very expensive process. And then to Deline's point, fraud is a, a billion rand industry uh, that's often perpetrated by people who supposedly owe a duty of care to the organizations that they work for. So there's a real interest in banking uh, to ensure that there is a successful implementation of digital identity, uh, particularly in South Africa. Um, to the second point, and, and I will, there are a couple of uh, documents, I think, in the handouts that you, you can read through um, in, in terms of what's happening in South Africa, I mean, South Africa is privileged. They do have a national identity that dates back to the 1950s. Uh, and since 1994, all South Africans have been able to get access to a green barcoded ID book. Uh, I think that was in about 1994, yes. Um, and the Department of Home Affairs has been on a route march to try and improve their offering. So they've moved from an ID book to an ID, a smart ID card. Now, several years ago, the South African Financial Blockchain Consortium focused on two concepts uh, uh, that, that are now taking a little bit of airtime. The one is digital identity, and we'll talk to that, and the other being central bank digital um, currencies. 
So with around 60 companies participating, which includes regulators, government departments, BankServe, which is a sister company to the Banking Association, has played a, a leading role in recording the digital identity narrative in South Africa and is now shaping use cases for three elements, EKYC for financial onboarding, RICA, which is the equivalent for mobile phone operators, and vaccine certificates for future use to improve the utility of the existing experience. And this document uh, is in the, in the handouts for you to read further. There are many other use cases that will develop organically. These are just a few, and we found these the most useful in order to get going and to be able to do something practical. And in South Africa, from April next month, uh, BankServe will begin uh, to collectively build the governance framework and the trust model for the digital identity ecosystem. It'll create a digital identity body that will eventually register prospective digital identity participants with government playing an active role in its creation. So we have an ambitious target date of July 2023 to finalize and launch digital identity. And although SSI is a targeted outcome and appropriate for this uh, ecosystem, uh, the entire ecosystem uh, will ensure that both centralized and decentralized uh, are accommodated within digital identity. So that's where we are at the moment. Very exciting. Looking forward to the next six months as we, uh, as Bank Serve Africa, in, in collaboration with all the participants, begin building out that governance framework and the trust model so that we can really get to start testing something in the real world of digital identity. Great. So clearly there is um, broader adoption and projects under the radar. And it's something that from an African perspective, um, we really kind of want to embrace this concept of digital identity and get it rolled out in the country, which is um, a very big move. Um, and without government support, there is a question in the, in the chat as well. Uh, what, is, uh, what is the perceived level of engagement from the African government? I'll, I'll park that one, but clearly from Mark's response, um, there are quite a lot of support and discussion with government inside the Banks of Project, and we are consistently... Um, kind of engaging with them to say, hey, you know what, we are going to do this thing. What might this mean for Africa? What might this mean for South Africa? And um, clearly we will need government support to actually roll this out successfully. Okay, moving on to the, I'm going to change my slide, <clears throat> but moving into the world of uh, self-sovereign identity. You know, this is a very specific term. It comes with a very specific set of technologies, um, governance associated with it. And as uh, the R&D head of, of APSA Bank, working with this technology now for quite a few years, um, Sean, can you give us an overview of what is SSI? What is this thing that we call the trust over IP stack? Uh, where does blockchain fit into all of this? Yeah, can you just give us an, an, an overview of, of what it really is and how does blockchain fit in and, and how is this whole technology stack and concept of SSI going to change identity going forward? Yeah, so just uh, let's call it a five-minute um, educational or five-minute information process uh, related to um, the concept. Uh, Mark touched, touched on a framework, a trust framework, if we um, look at the screen, Loanne is presenting, uh, consists of four layers. It's trust over IP uh, governance stack or self-sovereign governance stack. There's it goes by na many names. Um, but typically, it consists of the four, la uh, four layers. Uh, the bottom layer uh, being your blockchain DLT components. Um, so from a... South African perspective with the program that Mark was referring to that we are doing with uh, BankSurf slash PwC components that would consist of Hyperledger Indy, Hyperledger Aries, and Hyperledger Ursa. I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, uh, URSA. Um, that is the DLT component utilized within the solution uh, that we are looking at that would typically sit at layer one you would have layer two uh, 
um, where the peer-to-peer -peer communication takes place. And this talks to one of the comments that were asked um, related to, uh, you know, who's going to be monitoring us. So it is going to be a, it, it creates a peer-to-peer -peer connection. So only you who are sharing the data and the part who you're sharing the data with will know about the conversation. Um, so that's where the privacy component comes in. If we move up the stack, remember the layer two does have a communication with layer one, but as soon as the trust is established, they will talk directly to each other. We get layer three. Uh, layer three talks to, uh, let's call it how the information is shared. Um, so your issuer would be a trusted issuer, as we refer to as the golden source. In the case of your identity, it would be the Department of Home Affairs. In case of proof of bank account, that would be the bank that has issued you with the bank account. So if we take APSA, it would be an APSA bank account. APSA would be the golden source. You wouldn't go to for example, to Stainer Bank and ask them for proof of bank account that I have a proof of bank account with APSA. Um, your middle holder, that of course is your wallet, and typically that would be a mobile um, app uh, that would be in the center. And then you would have the verifier. The verifier is who, who, with whom you are sharing the data. Uh, that you, as part of the process, actually uh, give, give consent to that actual sharing of the data. Typically, it would be, uh, Dalian and them touched on it, uh, if I am, for example, having to, uh, I'm opening a bank account, for example, on a, and in this case, Bank A is the verifier, they want to know my ID, they want to know my date of birth, and not necessarily my gender. Um, you would then share with uh, the bank your ID, uh, date of birth, uh, but not the gender. Where in today's terms, when you give across your ID card, they make a photocopy of it, they've got all of that data. Where within this space, you only share the relevant information across a trusted link and then of course the top layer which is your different sectors within the ecosystem for example health uh, supply chain and for for example finance you would have your mno environment or your telco environment involved uh, as a in let's call it application from an ecosystem perspective if you are sharing um, identity with a bank versus sharing identity with an MNO versus sharing identity because I'm being admitted to a hospital, it's all the same identity. Um, the, it's not a different component of something. It's all, at the end of the day, the same identity. That is very quickly the um, overview of the trust stack. Uh, so back to you, Loe. Great, thank you for that uh, very short introduction to SSI. I know it's a very complicated uh, topic and it's not easy to, to explain it in a, in a short amount of time. Um, so Anushka, I would like to ask you a question and then I would like to um, go and kind of uh, pose some questions to the panelists that came up in the Q&A. But Anushka, from your perspective, um, what, do you, what do you see are the different use cases uh, in terms of self sovereign identity? In your line of work, uh, what projects do you know are currently happening? Um, and then the, the last question, and I actually want Anushka to give her answer, but then I'm going to ask the same question to all of you. And anyway, is how do we make this technology available for everyone? 
it's one thing to say, hey, you know what, you need to have a smartphone and you need to have data. But the reality is, like Terry mentioned, there are billions of people that don't have that capability. So if you can give a, a bit of a, a background on use cases, what's happening in, in your part of the, in your, in your line of work, and then how do we actually solve it for the people that don't have the, the current technology that we assume they should have to um, interact with the digital identity world? Okay, thanks, Lohan. So as you know, I'm product manager uh, for ecosystem at IOHK for the Tala Prism uh, product, which is our identity product. And we currently have three big projects uh, that are on the way um, still starting off in the early stages. But, you know, the POCs have already kicked off and there are already users that are onboarded. So we've got the Ministry of Education in Ethiopia uh, that's looking, you know, we realize that we need a digital ID to be able to issue learners with their grades, their education credentials, so that those education credentials can actually be used to apply to universities or apply for jobs. Um, and what's really amazing about this particular use case is that um, California government has just, you know, kicked off a project now saying they would uh, work on a trust framework or a governance framework similar to the Pan-Canadian Trust uh, framework. And their first use case is also going to be in education. So there's already this opportunity to collaborate between these two countries on different continents when it comes to this particular use case. Um, you know, at this point in time, there's about 8,000 students that are already uh, registered during the proof of concept and during the first phase of delivery. And that should grow to about a million by the end of the year. And then there's also the other side of the coin where teachers are, or um, teaching instructors are also being given teaching performance credentials in this project. So that's in education. Then we've got World Mobile, which is a telecoms company that's really wanting to connect the unconnected. And they've got a really innovative technology that they're testing out that will bring down the cost of, uh, you know, using uh, data and so on. Um, and this pilot currently has about 3,000 users. Uh, and the third project I will mention here is Pradesha in Kenya. And, you know, this project is looking at banking the unbanked. So as you can see, across these three industry verticals, identity is the foundation that needs to be put in place so that all these other things can actually be built on top of it. Um, so we're really looking at strong projects and we're hoping that they would be successful and fly. Um, hopefully by the end of this year, we'll have, you know, good examples to give. Um, your second question, I think, you know, the other uh, panelists spoke about other projects in South Africa and abroad as well. So there's a lot of use cases, but I'd like to uh, plant the seed of the convenience economy in people's heads today because I was having a coffee chat with a colleague and we came up with this concept of the convenience economy because, you know, imagine being able to um, perform transactions with all these different organizations in the world and in our country and in your life by, you know, at the click of a button, instead of having to fill out umpteen forms um, every other day. So, uh, yeah, let's see how we can make this convenience economy come through while also building up, you know, banking the unbanked and focusing on giving people digital identities. Um, in terms of how uh, people without devices and without data can actually participate, Lohan, I think this is where I find the blockchain community to be like absolutely phenomenal and focusing on community and solving community problems. And this is where I see real innovation taking place where people are saying, okay, data is costing a lot. So what is the data solution that we can come up with? What are the device solutions that we can come up with? And, you know, I've heard of um, POCs where instead of using a device, you know, perhaps using a QR code that's printed on a card or perhaps using a different type of card device, instead of a um, cell phone. So I think that we will see a lot in this space, but I'll let some of the other panelists speak about what else they are seeing. Thanks. So yeah, we are, we are basically out of time, but I wanna give all the panelists a, a very quick um, kind of closing remarks. And uh, I'm kind of going to collapse a lot of the questions in the Q and A into, into one, but first of all, like, just in a in a few seconds, what what do we need to do to to make this successful on a on a country level? And then 
how do we going to solve the concept of interoperability so that everybody can understand and utilize this technology at scale? And you can kind of go around, Robin. I'm not going to put anyone on the spot. You can just kind of unmute and then give your kind of closing remarks, please. Ben, I'd like to go <clears throat> first, if I may. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I acknowledge this convenient economy. It's very much part of where the digital data bank is going. But to make it successful, we have to give, we have to give the, the every citizen a mechanism to very easily be able to interact and transact over the internet. And it's just a matter of mitigating that risk of identity. All the other factors are all, all already in there, and that will just create the interoperability. You know, when banks talk to banks, if they don't, they don't question one another because they know who they are. And it should be exactly the same with an individual. Once an individual has been authenticated, they shouldn't have to worry about interacting and transacting any further or, or, or identifying themselves. And that, and once we've got that, we've then got true interoperability across all ecosystems. Um, yeah, so can you, the, the one thing, and I agree with what Terry and Anushka are saying, um, from a business perspective, though, in terms of creating interoperability, this is where the, the digital ecosystem or the digital community in South Africa, there is a, a digital identity um, community that's currently working really hard with a number of industry players around the table to say, how do we make sure that we hold each other accountable, that we have certain standards that we meet, that we create a layer of interoperability, but we also speak the same language so that we don't create mass confusion. Similarly, when it comes to individuals, basically what we're doing is we're recreating trust. Trust has been broken down on a, on a multitude of ways. Just think about the Tinder swindler and how something like this could solve a problem on a dating website. But we, we as consumers need to keep companies accountable and to say, when you're dealing with me, make sure that it's me. If we start driving that requirement in our, in our hyper-consumer in environment, consumers are becoming more aware of their rights when it comes to their data. And honestly, the only person that has the right to use your data is you, and you were given it by birthright. Nobody else has the right to use it. We need to stand on that and make companies accountable. But we need to bring the company and the consumer closer together through technology so that we can fight against fraud and create convenience for customers, both business as well as consumer. So, Ryan, if I can jump in there, I mean, um, digital identity is a foundational concept and it's going to create opportunities for much more to be done than what we are talking about today. We haven't even thought of some of the solutions that will come out of digital identity. And when we can get to the point where I can say that I am who I am because I say I am, that's when we are going to be able to actually enjoy the benefits of digital identity. And we've got to get to that point. So thank you very much for having me. Good. Anushka, do you have uh, anything, last comments? Well, I would just say that if anyone has the opportunity to participate in pilots or POCs or projects related to self-sovereign identity and digital identity, please, you know, step up, participate so that we can really accelerate what's happening here. Thanks, Lohan. Great. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, everyone. Unfortunately, we didn't get uh, um, to all the questions, but thank you to all the panelists. It's a very been a very interesting discussion and really looking forward to, to making this a reality. It's been a very long journey, and I think we are making... Um, small steps towards a big goal. And when we get to the point where this becomes pervasive and everyone is able to use it, even if it's low tech, high tech, smartphones, no smartphones, I think we would have the ability not only to enable an enormous amount of potential, but also unlock a lot of value and to do a significant amount of fraud. So thank you very much. And yeah. Thank you. Bye. Pleasure. Thanks, Lion. Thanks, everybody.